Well, welcome everyone. And well, good morning to our uh, West Coast guests and good afternoon to our East Coast guests. Uh, my name is Bianca Friundi. For those who don't know me, I'm the curator of the Italian American Museum in San Francisco. And on behalf of the whole museo, I would like to thank you all for joining us uh, today for this exciting conversation with Serena uh, Bocchino, uh, Italian American artist. I'm very proud to say it. <laughs> and thank you, Serena, for being here with us today. Thank you, you know, for thank your you, time Sarah. and for organizing this with me. Um, Serena's artwork is currently on display at our museum in the exhibition Rhapsody. And we will learn uh, more about her solo show in the course of our uh, conversation. Here's another guest. Uh, and as you can see, Serena is joining us from her art studio, you know, from her home in New Jersey. And she graciously um, agreed on taking us on a very quick tour uh, of her working place. Um, before starting our conversation. So thank you, Serena. And when you're ready, we're ready for the ride. Okay, it's, it may be a little bit fast. I'll do my best because we're using the camera on the computer. Very good. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is my workspace. And I put out work so you can just have a uh, quick view of what I'm doing. This is a recent painting from the Veil series. Um, nearby is sculpture. It's wire sculpture that I'm involved in. On the table are some works on paper. So there. As we go this way, you could see more sculpture that is hanging from the ceiling. As much as I've done sculpture all my life, probably, uh, it's been recently that I'm working so much with this idea of line and these lines in the middle of space that uh, creating a space and more of an installation. Um, let's see, here are some works on paper. There's a painting. These are pretty recent works you're seeing in the last few years. Um, this is let's see what we have here. sculpture. You can see I'm looking through the sculpture. It's some works on the walls um so some of them are painted sculptures embellished sculptures um and some i'm using clay as well i put out for you some works on paper this is something i've been working with only the last probably since 2019 are these veils so over the pandemic time as much as it was a difficult time it allowed many people to get projects accomplished and particularly for artists having more time in the studio or friends of mine who are writers who got to work on their novels and poetry. But this piece right here, not easy to really discern, I suppose, but it's the Veil series. So what these are, these are cropped areas of paintings and works on paper, and they are printed, digitally printed on a silk poly blend fabric that is just wonderful to feel, as well as it captures movement. So I was able to show quite a bit of them. Um, and as I go back, they're about 54 inches in width. I'm sorry, there's a painting there, it's a little hard, but 54 in width and they're quadrant style hung and installed and they're about 84, 90 inches long. So um, they really move in the wind and have a wonderful way to kind of play with the paintings that are on the walls. It's like a dialogue mm -hmm. that is created. And then you saw this piece. It's kind of cropped just in terms of my arms. This was a series, uh, part of a series I did when I was in China, 2017, that has the pieces of porcelain actually adhered to the painting. Um, and that's because where I was exhibiting Jin Denzen, which is the porcelain capital of the world. And particularly uh, many of the artists there are still studying, of course, porcelain. We were in a area where the museum was that um, was, had the largest kiln you'd ever seen. It was amazing. It's extraordinary. It was like a factory building or several of them put together 
And they were the kilns for much of the porcelain created in that region in particular. So um, here we go. And so you've got to see the different textures and mark making. A lot of this is with poured paint as well as brush. And so I think, is that good there, Bianca? Good enough? Yes, you know, thank you. I hope. Thank you, Sarina. Yeah, and I, I wanted to tell our audience that when, um, when we were working together on her um, exhibition and we were um, working on what pieces we were going to show in the exhibition in San Francisco, we have Zoomed many, many times. Oh, yeah. And she always zoomed from this room, from her studio. And I found that very like inspiring. And uh, when we were actually selecting the pieces, I felt like in a, in a candy store, oh, I would like that. Oh, I would like to show that one. And it was really like a fun, fun uh, experience and fun work. And I think that's, you know, the, the best way to work with an artist and, you know, uh, talk to the artist and uh, um, have the chance to see their works, um, their different uh, media, and why certain pieces are important uh, more than others maybe. So we, it was really um, an experience. It was fun uh, working with Serena and uh, you know, get to choose the, um, the paintings you know, hanging directly on a, on a wall. And in this case, in her, in her studio. Um, quick question before starting the actual conversation, Serena. What is your um, daily routine? What, um, what is a typical um, Serena Bocchino's work day? Well, the uh, objective is always to get in the studio. I promise you that. <laughs> right. To get there and to be able to have uninterrupted hours of working. And I prefer to work on a few things at once. So if it's not the sculpture and the three-dimensional aspect, while I'll have possibly, you know, drawings in progress or paintings in progress. Mm -hmm. So I try to do that. As all of us, life many times gets in the way and there are other things we do attend to. So either the hours in the day get shortened of creativity or, um, or not at all. So, um, but always the objective is every day you want to be in the studio. Right. So it's kind of a discipline. And then many times I'll say, well, I could only do it in the morning or I could only be there in the afternoon. I have found there are benefits to both having a studio at home, which I do now. And for many years, I commute to a studio and there were very, there were terrific benefits in that as well which you can imagine, I'm sure, similar to your lives you know, during the work at home. And you, you yeah. see the distractions, perhaps, and many times that uh, wonderful concentration and focus when you're traveling to a studio. The problem is when you have a home studio, I think the benefit is that you could be there at all hours of the night or day or morning, early hours in the morning. So I love that. And the very much, it's like brushing your teeth almost to be in the studio, as opposed to when you're driving to a studio or taking a train or whatever way walking, it, there's that space that, that is um, in between, if you will. So for now, I'm certainly enjoying it for the past many years, 15, 10 years, being with a home studio. So it could change. I mean, uh, both can work and both can stimulate what you're doing in the studio as well. So uh, artists, I know so many that work all different ways. For me, for now, this is good. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Sounds, sounds great. Um, so before asking you the first question, I would like to share my screen with all of you because Serena and I um, prepared some uh, images that we would like to show you while she is um, uh, answering questions and conversing so you can actually see what we are talking about. And can you all see my, my presentation? Okay, so Serena. It's like Jeopardy here. First question. <laughs> um, it's actually two questions in one, in a way. 
I wanted to ask you, how old were you when you first began painting? I think it's a you know classic uh, question. And also regarding your personal style, around what age um, you think you discovered this personal style? Wow, okay. Um, well, <laughs> one, one. Yeah, it's, that's a big question. Um, my mother was an artist, so, and we'll talk about that later, of course, but so I really had art in my life, my whole life, mm -hmm. in terms of visual art, music, always this very rich creative environment. So I'm the, um, I'm one of six children and we all had this very nurturing, creative place uh, as children. And many times I'm sure everyone watching, you know, perhaps had similar types of creative beginnings. We all are trying to make things and draw and, and sort of um, do those activities as a child. So what happened was, I guess, um, out of the six children, I was the one who continued to pursue it. Mm -hmm. So even as a teenager, I just kept going through and wanting to do it. And I have to say, teachers, besides my family, uh, teachers and outside people and activities kind of confirmed it. Um, my mom did always encourage me to kind of enter these competitions, um, huge people, being in this competition and I would always kind of win in some prize rank you know I maybe wasn't the first place but maybe the third place but a lot of confirming words into my life in pursuing being an artist um so that was more like high school and I was enjoying learning the rendering of a traditional um way to draw and paint uh, pastels with still life, oil painting. I loved it. And that was a lot to do teenage years, actually. Um, and then I guess your question about, and then I pursued it in college. I was always majoring in art, studio art. And I think it was really, though, probably not even my undergraduate uh, participation or student work, but more graduate school that I started really... Um, being much more purposeful about what I was going to go for and what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. um, we have a series of um, early paintings by you, Serena. Uh, I'm gonna start with one um, and then you can, you know, illustrate them, you know, um, as, sure. you, as you wish. Um, I'm gonna start with this. Okay, so this is a famous painting by John Singer Sargent. So it was something, John Singer Sargent, and it's a very interesting painter. I would encourage you all to look him up. He's amazing. But I was actually interested in his work very passionately. I loved the way brush strokes um, would create one quick mark. And you see this with many other artists of his time can capture a whole um, dress perhaps, or things like this. So I decided to start copying his work and some other artists from that period. And that was probably in my teen years for the most part or toward beginning of undergraduate. Mm -hmm. um, so this was one of the pieces. Right. So it demonstrates my very traditional beginnings and what interested me. I wanted to paint what I saw. And considering I'm an abstract painter right now, most people don't know that, but that was definitely what I wanted to learn. Yeah. And you see, we'll see that very, very soon. Um, I'm going to move on to um, a portrait. So... As after um, learning many traditional forms of pastel work and oil painting, I did in the beginning of undergraduate, I guess that would be, uh, start painting from photographs and cropping the photographs into these large portraits. And so I made quite a few of these very, um, you know, toward photorealistic, not totally there, but of that realism that I was totally interested in and I would make them rather large for me at that time, which was like, this is probably four by four feet, but many of them were even six by six feet, six by four feet, these gigantic portraits of men and women and trying to, what it did for me was taught me how to work with oil paint 
and understand the whole layering process. It really helped me with color. Uh, even though face you think could be just a flesh tone, how, as we all know, it really isn't. There's blues, there's greens, there's all different tones involved. And I really learned how to understand color and the workings of oil paint by doing this. Right. And um, we, Serena and I chose these two paintings. What one um, is actually in the exhibition uh, in uh, Rhapsody. And they're both uh, paintings by her um, that uh, feature her grandmother. And these two paintings, you know, already uh, tie your, you know, artist spirit with your heritage and your, you know, one of your biggest uh, influences, which is, you know, your, your grandmother. Um, so this uh, painting, Singer, uh, is hanging at the museo right now. And um, please tell us about uh, this painting. I love the Well, what's the interesting story. is before the previous two pieces, when I was young, like I'd say 10 or 11, I actually wanted to be a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. And that's what my passion was. And I just loved the idea. And I did develop characters. I submitted them to newspapers. I think they were even published. I was interested in that. So that's when I was like 10 or 11. Then the other paintings you just saw were me developing, learning skill sets, uh, understanding the idea of uh, translating what I actually see in the real world and being able to copy it or to interpret it as my way. What this happened a couple of years after the, those photorealistic paintings, now just understand the photorealistic pieces, you know, I made like 50 of them, okay? At least in all different sizes. So then I started understanding as an artist, what matters to me? What do I really want to translate and bring into the world? And that's where I started understanding that I wanted to bring the world around me and who meant the most to me to the public and use that as a protagonist in the paintings in order to develop, to develop more as an artist. Mm -hmm. And this painting, I started doing a whole series. I called them my Nana series, N-A-N-A. Mm -hmm. -A. And she lived with us. And I did many, many paintings of her walking down the stairs, several of them her, her sewing. And what happened was they started getting looser and looser. This is one certainly after I've done several. So looser and looser, and I became more confident in my brush stroke. Of course, a favorite was Alice Neal. If you're familiar with the artist Alice Neal, I think she's at the, Museo, the museum in San Francisco at the moment. But right. she was a very favorite. Right. And um, I could even tell you later when we discussed this book, Hero, she came into that picture, into that book. But loved her work, loved her interpretation of the people she loved and admired and found interesting looking. And I did the same. So she was like a hero of mine. Right. Someone I looked up to and wanted to continue working. My mother also, by the way, did many portraits. So she also was very influential and who do you, what do you want to say with your work? So she pushed me with questions like that at a young age, actually. Yeah. But anyway, so this is one of the Nana series. Yeah, and let me show the second one that we have here for today. So exactly. So you saw the, the, the beginning was the last one, Singer. It was a little raw. It was a little um, more direct. I had mark making and pencil in it, but getting much more confident in my visual vocabulary. Mm -hmm. This one is even later. And you could see how I'm developing that sense of oil painting and relaxation and, and more delving into perhaps having less on the canvas, but saying more, which is the brushstroke or the tones that I used. Right. Um, let me show the audience two more paintings. Oh, and, gonna, and just realize the scale on these paintings, these are like four by six feet. So they were always large. Human scale was important to me. And I still love working large. But there is something in the intimacy of small. But for me personally, these paintings right. had to be pretty big. Yeah. And I'm going to move on to this painting from 1985. Okay. okay, so by 85, I had... In, uh, I finished graduate school and um, 
I began to, I, I left the Nana series and I wanted to again revisit the idea of what is meaningful to me. Where is their passion that I get excited about and how do I translate that? So what began to happen was I did a series of works that were musical instruments. Mm -hmm. So rather than having my grandmother as the vehicle, perhaps for what I wanted to say, I started actually using musical instruments. Uh, I actually did a very specific series of drums. This is just one of them, but I actually have uh, paintings of different type of these conga drums and laying in fields and different areas. So I would put them in places that I wanted to translate an idea that I was excited about. Right. And again, oil painting. Yeah. Yeah. The oil on canvas. And we will see um, uh, in a bit that um, music together with you know, dance and movement um, has been and still is one of you biggest uh, inspirations to music is always uh, or very often part of your works. You're very um, influenced by, by music, by jazz music uh, also, we'll see. Um, this piece was a breakthrough piece. This work was actually in an exhibition in Soho in the 80s and was reviewed by the New York Times. This was, again, a musical instrument, but you could see the movement that I've gotten involved in. And um, also, I was attending a tremendous amount of performances during this time. I ended up... Um, being friendly with a patron of the arts at, who was particularly interested in music, who introduced me to John Cage, to Merce Cunningham, to Leonard Bernstein. And the experience that I was having at all these performances began to filter into my work. Right. Thank you, Serena. And one of of my questions and then um, so I'm going to ask you uh, now because it's it's a very it's a very important um, feature of your um, artist life and uh, like we saw before your grandma and then your mom also were uh, big influences um, we uh, together but it, it was your you know it, it it stemmed actually from, from you, um, your Italian heritage. Um, the show that is now at the, at the museum includes what we now affectionately call the heritage wall. And it features um, a few uh, works by your grandma, uh, Maria Confalone, and your mom, Lucia Bocchino. And it's almost like a small show in the show. And uh, with, with that wall, you wanted to juxtapose the works of basically three generations, your grandmas, your moms, and, and yours, um, your family's um, generations. And you wanted to celebrate your Italian roots and how important your grandma's and um, mom's influence has been over the years. Um, and let me just show the audience like the heritage wall very quickly. This is what, um, you know, is at the end of um, Serena's um, art path, basically at, at the museum. This wall, my Italian roots uh, conclude and um, Serena's um, show. Um, could you um, tell us about, you know, this heritage wall and uh, about your grandma's and, and mom's works. Yeah, I was very um, honored to really be able to honor them at the exhibition. It just seemed absolutely appropriate because I was shown at the Museo Italo Americano to um, lend um, the influences in my work of who I actually grew up with. So my grandmother's work was very fine crocheted work and sewing and her creativity. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure others can uh, relate to this because it also was generational. I mean, many people had grandmothers that have done this, 
but the intricacy that she lended herself and involved herself in was so intricate and specialized that she did get a reputation when she was in the Bronx, New York, to have um, different projects commissioned by others to create these beautiful um, dresses and outerwear. She did pocketbooks. It's just beautiful specialty items using her craft. She was like a fine artisan, really. And she did get very creative. She made many of my um, clothing and um, my sisters, my mothers, like she's very prolific and um, thrilled to have her involved and in the exhibition. Then my mother's work, I don't know if we're gonna Let me have a slide up. Did I'm we gonna, do a slide yeah, I'm gonna that? Show one more by your, oh, yeah. your grandmother. So by my grandmother. So this was like a top and it had like bell bottom pants with it and just the sewing and the embellishments and how she combined different uh, crafts is similar to, I combine different mediums. I mean, she definitely influenced the idea of um, fabric that I'm using now in my work, certainly in the Veil series. Right. And here is you, your mother's little stuff. Your, your mom's section is also like very varied and we, we decided to show different media, different works uh, by Serena's uh, mother. And here's one. So. Yeah, so she also explored painting. She did go to the Cooper Union and the High School of Music and Arts. So she had a very formal education. However, she went more into advertising. She um, became the assistant to an art director. Andy Warhol used to send them his work, trying to get a job. And they all knew, oh, where's that kid from Pittsburgh with those beautiful butterflies, silkscreen butterflies. So, I mean, she had the influence and she also was an opera lover. So she had all of that that she certainly passed to me and her mom had given to her. So in a whole cultural um, world, if you will. And so she was a painter. She also did collage work, assemblage work, more sculptural work. Um, I don't know if we have um, yeah. me any examples here. This I don't know. One. Yeah. Here, she were in the 70s, she was using different tissue paper to get that um, textural uh, element in the work. Right. You could see she's almost abstracted, but she actually always held on to representational references. That's something she always wanted to, to have in her work. Here, it's very interesting. You could probably capture, she cut out different uh, magazines and things right at hand and she did painting so she wasn't ever her work is I believe very fearless I felt she was always a more fearless artist than I am and and I think that's terrific that I'm able to always know that and I think it pushes me forward in experimentation my studio practice what I want to get involved in so I'm, I feel very very fortunate to have had these two women powerhouses in my life and also I, I would like to say that um, if um, you um, have the, the chance to visit uh, Serena's uh, exhibition and you are going to see the, the heritage wall next to it, we created a, a text panel with the story of Maria and uh, Lucia. Um, so um, please come and visit and read more about uh, Serena's mom's and um, grandma's uh, works and how much um, they influenced Serena's work. And also, I guess it, it kept your, you know, the love for your Italian heritage uh, alive. Uh, Very much. To this day. Very much. And, uh, and before delving more into, you know, your uh, sources of inspiration and uh, the actual works that are in the, um, in the exhibition, um, I actually wanted to show something. So Serena is, yes, she's an artist. She's a uh, painter, a visual artist. Uh, she's an instructor uh, and she's also an author. And Serena wrote um, several books, but what we would like to show you and what we would like to um, feature here today is this uh, particular book which is called What Am I? The Story of an Abstract Painting, which is a children's book. Uh, it has a wonderful story. 
and at the end of the book, Serena added some um, an educational page with a couple of activities that the children can um, can do. Um, and I'll let you take over Serena from here because there's more about this book. Well, when I was um, going to have my first child, Ezra, I remember I was very concerned with what, how am I gonna to explain to him what I actually do? So that's really the impetus for What Am I? The Story of an Abstract Painting. The book is based on an actual painting that is about six feet by nine feet. It is hung at other museums and I've been able to do um, presentations with the book to many children and teachers. And what's interesting even is the What Am I? book was recently installed in grand scale at Penn Station in Newark, New Jersey. So I was able to have large panels of the illustrations starting, as you could see here, uh, with elements of the painting. And it goes on and on to create, it's like 36 panels of the development of an abstract painting starting from, um, I think the first page is, what is it? The space was empty, which all artists understand when we have our empty canvases in front of them. And it goes on to say, so yellow came and all the variety of elements came and they've been given names and things like that in order to show children how uh, abstract paintings can actually reflect the environment around them. So when we were going to, uh, we started the discussion, Bianca and I, about the development of the exhibition um, we came to a wonderful conclusion with the idea of translating the What Am I book in English into Cosa Sono, into a bilingual book in Italian and English. And I'm so thankful that Bianca and her sister lent their wonderful understanding of the Italian language to this <laughs> it was book. Fun. <laughs> so it was a great collaboration. And um, I'm just so honored to have them do that and that the Musea was excited to have that project done. And um, what a wonderful, you know, tangent kind of project to this exhibition. It was really a fun collaboration. It was really so it's, yeah, it's, it's a bilingual book. And so you could learn the Italian language or the English language for that means really. Right. And, and, and yet just to, to enhance what we're talking about, this whole idea of the, the Italo-Americano experience. And it makes sense to us to have something like this at the Museo because we do um, have uh, books for children that are both in English and in Italian. And, uh, and in this case, you know, a, a child can, you know, practice uh, art. They can practice, you know, drawing or painting and they can practice the language. So it's like really um, a win-win situation. And you, if you um, visit our museo, we have uh, both books um, at our gift shop. So one more reason to come and see the, the show. Um, so uh, Serena, going back to um, your art and um, your influences, um, we mentioned briefly before that your art is highly influenced by dance and music and, um, and movement. Um, how would you say you incorporate them into your works or better, how have you incorporated them into your works over the years? Over the years. And I will start. Uh, the <laughs> idea of dance, music, right? Dance and music in yes. particular. Well, we can and discuss, music. you want to... So these, should I show these works for, these are Eureka Sachs is, a, this is a work on paper with charcoal and graphite. And what happened was, so after um, sort of interpreting the Renaissance instruments, I was able to have a um, studio residency at a place called PS1 in Long Island City. It is now PS1 slash Museum of Modern Art has taken it over and they still, I'm not sure if they have artist residencies anymore, but they do wonderful exhibitions. So while I was at that residency, um, the idea of the saxophone became my 
next protagonist, I would say, of my work. So I actually explored it in every aspect imaginable to the point where I was playing the alto saxophone and learning all about that. Uh, I did take classical guitar as a young person for many years. So I already understood the idea of reading music, but certainly with a um, wind instrument, it was, it was different. Um, so I started learning a lot about that and I started drawing the instrument, painting the instrument. So what I did was these instruments were abstracted and you can see at the top, even another uh, sort of abstracted instrument there. But what I did was use that shapes and simplified areas of the instrument. And I would always have these bursts with them. So the burst here would be that line of pink going across the bottom. I mean, as a literal translation, those bursts became the passion of the instrument as well as juxtaposing it to this very modeled oil paint and to these large shapes of different type of saxophones and shadows of them and little inklings of them. And let me show this one to you, like really different. Okay, media. yeah, so you can see in this sculpture, um, very much the double sax that's hanging at the top. I hope you have a clear vision. Then the idea of the shadow play. These are things that I'm using now, actually. And this was how many years, so many years ago. So it's amazing how as an artist, you just keep developing and everything keeps uh, building upon itself and moving forward. I mean, certainly that is, that's what I desire with my whole body of work. Um, but the saxophone, the other part, like I really had all different things thought out with this series. It was that every title had to have the word sax in it. So it was soul sax. Um, this is a different interpretation of it, but it was like Eureka sax. It was a uh, wind sax. It was pink sax. You'll see that. I think that's next. Yeah. So you see the way it was a very subtle. I love the subtlety of having all little ghosts, if you will, of the work. And then some would come forward, some would go back. Um, then of course I was working on the color aspect. Um, I had a wonderful colorist teacher, his name was Boy Fangor, a Polish teacher. Um, but he was actually, he's a very famous um, world renowned uh, artist. And he would, I didn't realize that at the time, you know, when you're in college or you're not sure about your professors. But now I realized that um, how spectacular he was. And color is one of my strengths, I, I've been told, and I think so. So it's something I'm totally interested in. And that came from him certainly being my mentor. And it was able to be kind of uh, played out. And I learned even more and more, of course, the more paintings I did. And that was through the residency at PS1. And I, I must have created more than 100 drawings and paintings of this idea of saxophone. This was my passionate instrument. This is where I exploded with, with learning about the instrument, how to use it compositionally, and how to bring color in, not to necessarily overwhelm, but to just suggest the essence of that instrument. Um, out of the blue, because you know, you, I was listening to you and that we were showing all these different uh, works and media. Would you say that, maybe not, maybe not. Would you say that there's a specific medium that you have used over the years that say goes better with the concept of music or how to represent music in art? Maybe there's not, maybe, I don't time. think so. Yeah. That's a very good question, though, because now that I am, remember, you, I now I don't use oil paint. I haven't used oil paint for a number of years, but, um, well, I kind of use, I, I predominantly use a water-based paint right now, but I do still use oil. But since I'm using, as you saw earlier, the wire uh, for interpreting the music, because we'll go on to the more contemporary work or my more recent work, where I'm actually painting the sounds of the instruments. I don't know if we're going to segue into that, but um, we'll I, I need a bit. <laughs> a bit. You yes. have a little time. So yeah. I guess I can't say there is. I think I could interpret the ideas in music uh, using a lot of different mediums, right. actually. Many more than I even use now, I'm sure. Yeah. And my next question to you is finally, we're going to 
you know, talk about, you know, your show uh, at the museo and the works that you are displaying. Um, so at the museo, you are displaying um, different paintings and different works from um, different series. Uh, we will see the 12th series, the Divine Nine series, the mirror, the veils that you already showed, you know, earlier. You, you actually showed us the, the veils, the actual uh, veils. Um, could you tell us something about this particular series and how they were developed? And before you start, I'm going to place this slide here and let you take over. Okay, so the reason why we wanted to show this slide is because I really do think this is the essence of my studio practice. And this is a very well-known Picasso drawing going from a um, very, would you say, realistic or representational um, image of a bull to just a few lines that represent the same image if you will, or the same um, bull. Right. So for me, I just thought it was important. And hopefully from the slides that we've shown you today, you'll see from the John Singer Sargent to the realistic photo paintings, you know, their interpretations, paintings, um, to this, because I do feel very passionate. This is what I've worked to create and continue to work on. And what that is, is a very detailed idea of the world around me and what I'm trying to say to something that has just been reduced to just lines or areas of color. And um, so that Picasso illustration is, is fantastic for me personally, and I get very passionate about it. This painting, Star Dance Lead, is from the Twirl series, which is about the idea of dancing. And you could see even I have musical notes on the painting. And this is drawing, um, this is graphite and charcoal on canvas, then juxtaposition to the very fluid poured paint. And then it has areas of gold leaf that give you kind of a rest on the painting. It, it gives you pause, if you will, similar to in music, you have a pause, areas of pauses. So, um, this is reflective of being very much in the idea of dance and the idea of choreography, uh, the figures eight that show up in dance many times. And um, that's what that painting I would say is about. You can much. almost hear the music looking at it. <laughs> and yeah. here's um, the famous Tondi by the Divine Nine series. We do have three Tondi at the Museo uh displayed um but here um serena wanted and rightly so wanted to show the nine of them this is the the whole series of the of the tondi so it's hard to see in the image but the okay so there's three of them that are uh paintings and used um different metal leaf uh copper and gold and mirrors so it's a little hard to see here that's why if you go to the museo, you'll see them in real life. But the other pieces are on mirrors. So it's painting, painted, poured, and drizzled mirrors. So there's a reflection. You see yourself in those mirrors. And that was very much about the idea of, it's, it's over the top, but the theater, the theatrical term of the fourth wall, I guess, breaking through that and actually having the audience in the artwork. And because they're circles, you know, it just develops a lot of challenges for the artist, um, which I always like to challenge myself and bring other uh, mediums into the work and see, you know, work on that composition and how I'm being challenged in the studio. And here is a, hmm, an installation uh, that we affectionately call the door. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> it looks like a door. Yes. And um, it's almost like two installations in one. Because thanks to the, you know, the, the light, um, you can see also the, the shadow of the whole, you know, painting. And it's really like having two works at once. Exactly. It's true. 
And that's also enamel paint with mirrors. So again, we bring the mirrors in. The hard edge of the mirrors that I incorporate into the composition is very interesting because like, a, you know, you have the hard edge juxtaposed to the fluidity and the organic aspect of the pour. Right. And there are uh, mirrors in other, uh, on other paintings by Serena in, in the show. In the, if, if you come and, and see them, you will see that also create lots of, not only points of light, but also movement um, in the whole uh, painting. And uh, let me show the last one for today. We're not showing everything because we want you to come and see the show. Of course, this is like, you know, um, small bites of what you are going to have uh, at the museum, like a sneak peek. Here we go with the veil series. Oh, can you actually see it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Purple squeeze. Yeah. And uh, what uh, Serena um, would decided to, um, this is part of, you know, the, the show. And at, at the beginning, if you remember, Serena was showing um, the actual veils that she used in several um, exhibitions. And we wanted to add this photograph from another uh, installation and exhibition. Would you like to uh, tell us about this, Serena? Sure. Were... So I became, over the pandemic time, one of the things I wanted to investigate is the idea of uh, veils of color on the canvas. So thin areas of color overlapping. So I would still have areas of line, but it was used in a different way. So I became so involved with this, like so many series that I do, I thought of uh, cropping areas of the paintings and interpreting them on actual veils. So as you could see here, and I was trying to show you when we did the studio um, walk area here, but um, that they're actually quadrants. They can be shown that way. I will be showing them actually at another space uh, as just simple sheer um, panels also removed from the wall. Because what interests me uh, with these is that when people walk by them, so it reminds me of dancing also, the veils capture the movement. They actually move within the space. So the, the person in the space has a um, dialogue with the veil, as well as the veils having dialogues with even the two-dimensional images on the wall. So there's like a whole so, sort of um, language and dialogue going on and, and it's just interactive mm -hmm. as an installation. So at this museum in Wyoming, the Nicolaisen Art Museum, I was able to show several more than this. I think there were five quadrants of the veils. Beautiful. Thank you. And last but not least, um, you have recently published another book, which is called Heroes, Women yes. Artists Who Influence and, and Inspire. And Heroes, we'll see, um, is more than a book. It is a collection of poem paintings. It's almost like an experience by itself. And how did you develop this book, Serena? And okay, I am why? so glad you brought this. Yeah, you brought this up because Heroes also, um, similar to that Picasso piece, is really about my entire almost, you know, life as a professional fine artist. Um, Heroes is a 30 year project. When I was in college, I began, I, I was, um, went to many, many, many exhibitions of other artists work. And what happened was I would go to the exhibition and I would be so moved or sometimes I just sit in the gallery and start doing free verse poetry, responding to the work or responding to the artist or just my experience. So these are actually 37 artists that have influenced and inspired my work. They're not only artists that I'd see in a gallery, 
Many of them are artists I was a studio assistant for, or I worked for, or I became friendly with. So we have artists like Lee Krasner, who I never met, but I had received a Paula Krasner award. So that was my connection, besides the excitement of seeing the Lee Krasner work. Um, another one was Irma Seitz. I was fortunate to meet her in Princeton while her husband was Bill Seitz who ran the Museum of Modern Art. So when I'd visit her, she'd have walls of very accomplished artists from de Kooning to Pollock mm -hmm. to just Rothko. She had all these paintings. So we'd sit there and have a chat and, and you'd just be overwhelmed by the magnificent work. So that impacted me. Um, I worked for Susan Rothenberg for 10 years, fantastic artist. Of course, she influenced my life when we meet every a couple of times a week and just we do things and I'd assist her in any way she needed. So um, this is a piece by uh, Joan Mitchell, if you could see it. I never met Joan Mitchell, but I certainly responded to her incredible work. So this is a poem painting with words intertwined with oil paint on vellum paper and that was, and then, so in the book, I have a bio, bio of Joan and then I would have my connection to her. And that's how every book, every uh, poem in this book, this is um, Via Selmans, who I also met when I worked at the Broida Museum. So this is uh, when I saw her work that was all about waves and different areas and very tedious, pieces, in incredible work of waves. And I wanted to pay tribute homage to them and that was over the pandemic. And I do have to um, bring up a fantastic, my graphic designer who really made such a beautiful book. Her name is Gail Shimon, oh, yeah. very, very talented. Yeah. And you can see all the names of all the artists that influenced my work. And uh, I just wanted to pay tribute to them. And Lily Way, who's a wonderful writer, an art writer and critic, uh, wrote the essay. And the name of her essay is Wonder Women. And she did a beautiful job in, in understanding what I was trying to say. And um, so I hope you enjoy it. We're very, um, you know, honored to have this book, which is a, a fantastic way um, to, you know, an artist who celebrates other artists. An artist, a woman uh, artist who celebrates women artists, and um, her, you know, most important uh, sources of inspiration, and I find it very relevant uh, nowadays, very also current, I would say. Um, so thank you for for that. And uh, before um, ending and taking questions, I already saw a couple of questions in the chat that I will read for you, Serena. I just would like to give the audience like a quick, um, you know, another small bite of uh, what they're going to see uh, at the museo. Um, you know, the um, works that are actually hanging in our museum right now. And I invite all of you to come uh, visit. We are open. Um, Tuesday through Saturday from 12 to 4 p.m. And also Sundays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And please check our website uh, for hours and more information. Um, come and visit Rhapsody because it's a powerful show. Rhapsody also includes um, two more artists, but this one uh, is, you know, Serena's solo show. And it you'll see it's very, um, powerful and also you'll get to see the heritage wall that we talked about uh, today. So art and Italian heritage at the same time. So we're very honored to have uh, Serena's show. Well, I just wanna thank all family and friends and professionals, colleagues that have joined us today. I really appreciate it. We've gone way over time, but I appreciate your patience and um, you know just your attention at this wonderful afternoon thanks for coming to my studio <laughs> thank you for your time serena thank you for being with us uh, and thank you all the guests who attended today thank you see you Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. 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 Ciao.
Ciao. Ciao.